You ready? It begins. It begins. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Learn with Jason. Today on the show, we are live in studio with the one and only Adam Argyle. How are you doing? Hello. <laughs> I feel well. I'm happy. <laughs> and I'm so happy to have you here. This is going to be a lot of fun. I, uh, I, this is the, the second attempt at doing an in-person show, but it's the first one where we've got multicam. So this is going to be a lot of fun. We are going to be able to, uh, to focus on everybody as we go, and we're going <laughs> to test my multitasking skills as I attempt to have a reasonable conversation with Adam, monitor the chat, build an app, and also control the cameras. <laughs> you got this. I've seen you do worse. So, uh, Adam, for folks who aren't familiar with you and your work, do you want to give us a bit of a background about who you are, what you do? Sure. Uh, engineer, uh, focus heavily on CSS, front end, UI. I want things to feel smooth, look good, feel good. It's like uh, you get in a car and one is crusty and one feels nice, and you're like, no, I prefer the one with the nice interior, right, that like form fits to you as you sit in. That's how I like websites. I like to think about them uh, in that way that you open it up and it just goes, I see you and it form fits to fit you, uh, whether it's your color scheme or whatever. Anyway, I just love uh, animated, good interfaces, probably because I love video games, you know, something around there. Um, and now I work at Google. I've been in the industry for 20 years building websites and I focus on CSS on the Chrome team, trying to make it easy for you too. I love that. I, uh, I, I mean, I've been following your work for a while. I feel like we've been friends for a while. And you have this knack for building like very simplified use cases that are just so nice to use. And I, I find that to be so like pleasant to work with, right? You, um, it, some of the, the more recent ones, we can look at a few actually as we switch over into screen sharing. But like you did some things with just, you know, like a squishy... Uh, image carousel and like, you know, things that just, they just kind of like, you use it and you go, huh, I like that. That's <laughs> nice. <laughs> that is the um, feeling I would like to invoke. Yeah. And I feel like a, I'm a sushi chef in the middle of uh, a bunch of other folks that are like cooking in big kitchens with big, you know, like if you're in a corporate cooking situation, right, you're gonna have all these chefs, all this process. And I'm in the corner making sushi, trying to bring as much joy to you with as smallest amount of ingredients as possible. Oh, I love that. I mean, and, and I do think like it, it's very interesting to me, the, um, it, it seems like we've, we've almost gotten to a point where CSS itself doesn't get taken very seriously, I think as a, as a general rule, which is really a bummer because CSS has so much to offer and is, especially over the last couple of years, just like so much more powerful than uh, than anything that I would have imagined, you know, 20 years ago when it first came out, right? Same. Not yeah. even not even 20 years ago, right? Like it was late CSS? 90s. No, I wait, when did it come I, out? I think it's 30 years old or something like Is that. Is it full 30? Point. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And there's some early early CSS in there, but yeah, it's old. <laughs> yeah. So so you know, back back in the early days when it was like everything was afloat, everything was uh, you know you didn't have a lot of these custom layout things. But then fast forward today, we've got grid, we've got animation, we've got uh, we've got cool color spaces, we've got like variables, we've got control flow, we've got feature detection. Like it's starting to feel a whole lot more like a real programming language. Um, and and what I've noticed is that folks like yourself have started pulling together um, like just what sort of feels like, a, I, this word has a load, it's like loaded, but like artisanal movement of like people building stuff that feels really good. Um, and and what I love is seeing the stuff that you're putting out, you know, the, the rest of the folks on your team, Yuna, Brahmas, like doing amazing stuff, um, but also folks like, you know, Lynn Fisher is out there doing incredible stuff with CSS. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm like blanking on additional names, but there's so many people doing so many cool things to highlight what you can do with just CSS. Uh, I even saw somebody who'd written like a, it was a Morse code interpreter that was pure CSS. I tried to look at the, I couldn't understand the code at all because it's <laughs> yeah. very like esoteric, but it's cool that that's possible. So I guess what got you into, like how did you become a CSS specialist? Mm, okay, so I was in school uh, learning Java, uh, studying SQL, PHP, um, kind of, anyway. That was before they added the script to it, right? Before they added the script to? To the Java. And JavaScript was out, but it just was, it was a toy language, which is still how a lot of people treat JavaScript. They're like, Psh, JavaScript is the YOLO version. You gotta write TypeScript if you wanna be hardcore mode. Anyway, okay, so I'm in class 
right? And all these people are building their assignments and they're happy to just print uh, the calculation to the console, you know? And that was them f feeling finished with their work. And I've been playing video games like my whole life. I love them. And I'm like, you're done, but there's, you can do more. And like, why don't you make it look good? Why don't you make it do something cool and animate it? And there was all these opportunities. And so I kept extending myself beyond the basic assignments and doing something that looked good. I was also struggling so hard. I was not a natural coder. Um, everyone else in the class seemed to be very, very good at it right away. Um, and so I had to work really hard just to get my console log to print. And then I would go the extra mile boosting up all the animations. Um, and so once I was in classes long enough to realize that I was one of the few that cared about how it looked in my in my school, uh, I switched. So I finished my, um, there was like an AA in computer, what was it called, database and web scripting. It was like database admin and web scripting or something like that. Anyway, I switched to art school and then I got a job in the field. Uh, so I focused on the art side. I was like, if I'm, if I'm interested in it and none of the other developers are, I should go focus on that a little bit. And that kind of began my journey of, what be quickly became fulfilling uh, designer's dreams. I was like, I make designer's dreams come true. I make designer's dreams come true is, <laughs> it, that was like the first business card, right? It, like you forgot to put your name on it. You were so excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I just, so yeah, I've been loving it since then, since I realized I was the weirdo that could, that cared and yeah. No, I think that's, I mean, I, I find that to be really exciting because it's, you know, I talk a lot about being a generalist and how I tend to dabble in everything and, and never really go deep. And, and so it's always really fun to talk to somebody who has, has sort of taken a, a specialist approach and like, you know, let's get down to the bottom of this and see what's really possible. And like, how can we take this as far as it can go? Um, because it, you know, it just, the stuff that you come up with doesn't even occur to me as being possible. Right. And then you're coming out and then, of course, I'm going to just copy paste it because now I can do that. Like, hey, great. Thank you for giving me this toolkit so that I don't have to learn how that works. You are welcome. I love it. That's like the best part about it is that this stuff is forkable, takeable. Right. Um, it's a it's a huge feature of our industry is that I agree. I think I mean, you know, we give each other crap for for copy paste, but I think that it really is magical that you can you can basically level up in a day by finding a good example and then being able to, you know, you have to know enough to re reverse engineer it because you can't just like copy paste it straight up, but like being able to say, okay, you did this. And if I take this and I change these little bits, I've made something that's unique to my thing, but I didn't have to learn like the underlying, like here's how to interpolate values in CSS or something like that, right? Yeah. Um, so speaking of interpolating values in CSS, I know we've got a lot to cover today. So what do you have in mind? I have built uh, an ephemeral, noise experiment, uh, but it's like silent noise where we'll share a visual art experience that we can't hear each other, but we can see the sounds that we're making. And Which I guess we're gonna, that will be mostly true because <laughs> like in, in normal practice, yes, today, because you're gonna see us making the noise and also, uh, and also see the, the output of it, you'll be able to hear the sounds we're making that, that Put the thing on but usually no usually we'll be able to see your viewers noise we'll that's see. true yeah this is going to be this is going to be team play y'all so uh so be ready when we get to the right point it'll be you know probably about two-thirds of the way through the episode we're going to ask you to open up your browser and turn on your mic and make some noise and that can be yelling waving your arms plug in your guitar do whatever you want right uh we're gonna we're gonna try to have a lot of fun with this so um do we need to cover anything else before we just start looking at code? I want to make sure we have enough time. Let's jump into some code. Let's jump into yeah. some code. All right. So, let's see some so let's do this. Let's let's stuff, go yeah. to let's go to group mode where you can see. Look, he's real. I can I can touch him. I can push him. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> We're can, here together. I can see the bunny. I was like, I should have brought a big mustache and put myself there on the wall. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's let's get the the code up on the window, and for some reason I've lost my screen. We're just gonna fix that real quick. There we go. Um, and all right, so first and foremost, we are talking to Adam Argyle. So here is a link to the site. That is absolutely not the thing that I was trying to. <laughs> Nerdy.dev. There it is. Nerdy.dev. 
Um, and then we've got, and this, what, what's up chat? How, how y'all doing? It's good to, good to see you. <laughs> Ready to make some noise, super excited about that. We are in fact gonna code it live, but not just, not just the regular live where it's, it's on a Zoom call, but like the live live, like in meat space. I'm so happy about it. <laughs> uh, synesthesia, but make it CSS. I mean, that's not wrong. Oh, yeah, yes. that's kind of fun. That's kind of fun. Um, me holding back my laughs. I would never hold back a laugh. That's <laughs> <laughs> it's like holding back a sneeze. CSS podcast with Yuna. That is a fantastic thing. Thank um, you. Thank you. Everyone knows Adam. I I would agree, but we will never rob someone of the chance to talk about what they're into. <laughs> um, okay. First time you've ever joined a LinkedIn Live. Oh, what's up, Sarah? How are you doing? Uh, okay. Let's let's dive in here. So we have we got a lot to cover. Um, you gave me a doc but I'm gonna do my best to only look at it when I need a link, so I'll let you drive. So what uh, what do we wanna do first? All right, so I kinda wanna build folks up to how I came up with the idea. Okay. Um, and if you've followed me on Twitter, you know I love gradients. Um, you know, I'm kinda punky and I like brutalist design and architecture, and so I also wanted to build something with Party Kit. This was my own volition. No, nobody told me to do that. I just like real-time experience. Sockets are cool, y'all. Sockets are cool. Sockets are cool. I feel like they're not used enough. I 100% agree. I, I think, well, I think they were used the right amount for how hard they used to be to use. Um, but I think that now that we've got tools like Party Kit, they are definitely not used enough. Yeah, when Firebase came out, I built a social network where um, everything was so real time. If you changed your avatar, it pushed the avatar change to everyone there. So imagine you're scrolling your feed and someone changes their avatar and it changes in front of you. I like that. I was like, why fun. isn't more stuff real time? I was like, <laughs> we can get intense with this. Uh, anyway, okay, so what I wanna do is build build fo folks up. So we'll, we'll look at a simple app property animation because app property is this like unlocking potential for different types of, if you wanna interpolate a variable, app property makes it quite easy. And that's because you tell the browser a type and then it can know when you're going from one value to the next that it should stay within the type. So. Anyone that doesn't know, CSS has types, and now it actually has strong types. They're enforced types through app property. Uh, and so our first uh, demo is going to just show you how to do a basic app property interpolation. We'll set one up. We'll connect it to a slider. And when the slider changes values, it'll write a new value to the custom property, and the custom property will interpolate from where it was to somewhere new. So it's a basic transition of a custom property. Sick. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's see. We're, we're looking at the, the app property syntax here on MDN. I dropped a link into the chat for that. Um, let me put that up on screen for a hot second. Also, can I show you all a trick that has really made my life easier? Watch this. MDN.io app property. <gasps> Gasp. And it shows up on this page. That wonderful work by the MDN team. Just absolutely love that. Um, Okay, so I'm ready. I'm going to create a pen. I have one prepared. You have one prepared. Then I'm yeah. going to go into the dock and I'm going to yeah, grab that click this one. one. Yeah, the top boy. Yeah. Top boy. Isn't that a, that's like a British thing, right? Like you can be the know. top boy. Is it? I don't know. I feel like I've heard that phrase. I just feel like people call things boys for funsies. And I just did it right now. I don't know why. <laughs> I do like calling things boys. I, I was noticing here. Show show everybody your your knuckles. Oh yes. See, uh, you're gonna have to pull back to be in focus. But do you see? Do you see here the uh, the the curly boys and the round boys and the square boys on the knuckles? Oh. I will fully be stealing that idea. I hope awesome. that you're ready because I've been thinking about knuckle tattoos. And what I was gonna do is I was gonna get snug life across the nice. knuckles, which I thought was really funny. <laughs> but I don't know. I think the curly boy, curly boy is symbols are fun. Uh, that's fun. They're my like favorite that. tattoos on my hands. Oh man, they're uh, you see them all the time. Uh, they're very exciting. They they felt like a prison thing you got. You're like I'm like a prison. <laughs> I'm tough. I'm tough now, but I got <laughs> super nerdy ones. I got earth, wind, water, fire, and then the four elements of coding. So I have like the four elements of earth and the four elements of coding, and they're coming for your face. <laughs> 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 I don't know. <laughs> Need a more clever. Uh, oh, name geez. It's so good. It's so good. Um, yeah. Oh, Top Boy is a show. Top oh. Boy is a, That's why I knew that phrase. Top nice. Boy is a show. Cool. Okay. Um, people are into the tattoos. It's, this is <laughs> this is good. All right. Um, I have so many nerdy ones. I got like webs and spiders, and I'm just like. I know. I'm. I'm like. I just. I feel like I. You know. I. I got a lot of tattoos when I was in a band, and then I got into 
being an, uh, what I, I guess is an adult. And it just like, <laughs> like my prioritization I think is wrong. I've been very slow to get more tattoos. No worries. Uh, from CSS to MMA. <laughs> <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> All right, so we got this. We got this thing. So we're looking at. I see uh, an H1, and then we've got a range slider. Yep. Oh man! Right off the bat, notice the ID is demo, and then the ID of the input is size. And look at the JavaScript. It says size dot on input. Wait. I'm sure most of your walkers have no idea that that works. Since when? Forever. That shit is old as time, man. I, IDs are my, on the window object. They're unique and they're always available with no selector, no query selector. If you've given something an ID, you can just reference it because it's the, it's there. Do you ever have one of those moments where you realize how many minutes of your life you've wasted? <laughs> <laughs> Me typing document dot query selector oh, is yeah. is one of those things. I uh, I love the API. I hate typing that out. Uh, I even have a library called Bling Bling JS. It's an ES6 module. Does it just make it into the jQuery? It's the dollar, yeah, and it just <sighs> makes it. And I'm like, this script alone will save you characters. Uh, it's a really tiny import. This was, this was, yeah. <laughs> look at this. Look at, look at this. We've what? broken, we've broken the chat. What? <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, people are about to play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, look at the code. Size on input and then demo.style. Yeah, is... you, yeah, frameworks are great. They make this stuff easy. I'm like, there's nothing there. This, so again, I like the sushi chef style, right? I'm like, how much can I shave off? I want you to get the mm, bare minimum good. to get the thing done. The good, good. All right. So, uh, okay, so we're looking at the size dot on input. Yep. Okay, I'm going to get over my, my rage. Um, and then... Inside of this, I'm just gonna make this even bigger. We are taking the demo, we're setting the property to, and then we're setting a size uh, variable. Yep. And that is going to be set to the current range value, which is somewhere between zero and 300. Okay, yep. okay, I'm in, I'm following that. And then in here, we've got, we're importing open props, okay. Just the easings, because there's some sweet springy bounces in there that just bring some life. And for anybody who's not familiar with open props, uh, that is a uh, collection of CSS variables that you maintain that is compatible with everything, right? Like you can use it with plain CSS, you can use it with Tailwind, you can use it with kind of whatever you want, right? Yep, they come in JavaScript, they uh, flavors, they come in CSS flavors. Uh, there's JSON tokens so that you can integrate it with CICD. It's trying to collect the world's most impressive uh, things that you can put inside of a variable all in one place. And so some of it feels like a design system. Some of it is just for funsies. Some of it is mad rad tricks. Holy crap, the masks you and the gradients. You can tuck some incredibly strong features into just a well-named variable. And so that's kind of what it's doing. It's trying to be that, that aggregator. It's, it's real good stuff. Uh, we have an episode up about it on Learn With Jason. So if you head over to Learn With Jason and you type in open props, you're gonna find this episode here. Yeah, I remember. I hope you do. <laughs> yeah, you were there. I was there. <laughs> yeah, we built a next site. We did build a next. Why did we build a next site? Like of all the things. I don't know. It's easy to spin up something that had some data and some stuff to style. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah. Never done this with CSS, about to start exploring, crawling out of the back end. All right, welcome. <laughs> welcome Ooh. to the front side. <laughs> you emergeth. Uh, yes, this is this is wonderful. All right, so um, let's let's climb on in. Uh, CSS variables are one of the, the best recent CSS things, I agree. Um, yeah. It's and it's fairly recent, like like the last five years or they so. They feel new. I feel that's kind of why open props feels innovative, is because um, they're new enough that we're still learning what mm. they can do and what you can tuck into them. Um, I mean, people have put SQL queries in CSS variables before. Just let that sit for a second. <laughs> and JavaScript, you can put JavaScript in a custom property. And that that I have done. Um, yeah. That's actually really useful because you can you can kind of like, well, it's sort of what you're doing here. Like we're telling we need a little bit of JavaScript to react to somebody's input, mm -hmm. but 
by putting most of it into the CSS, we just kind of let the CSS do the thing that it does. Um, and then we have access to whatever's in the CSS property, which I guess like if you needed JavaScript, you could also put that in the data set or something and maybe not need a, a CSS variable, but hey, whatever, use the tools you got, right? Yeah. So, all right, let's take a look at this. So we've got um, this at property and immediately, this looks a little different than like what you might expect if we were doing uh, the way that I'm used to, which is to do something like this. Yeah. So why don't I write it like this? Like why the why the extra? So when CSS, since CSS is so loosey goosey about uh, what you can put on a custom property, it doesn't do any type inference like mm -hmm. JavaScript does, right? JavaScript, you said var or const to something and it goes, oh, I noticed that's a string and it kind of dynamically types it for you. Uh, this is the nature of it dynamically. This, this, uh, is, this is what uh, JavaScript sounds like in your head. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed you're trying to do a loop, bro. <laughs> Personified scripting, I love it. Uh, yeah, so okay, so JavaScript can do that. CSS with custom property, it, it intentionally is naive. And so we have to be like explicitly tell it this size is a length. So notice the type there, it's kind of kind of got an XML shape to it. Mm. You give it an initial value, which needs to be of the same type or else obviously it won't work. Things will explode, and then yes. And inherits true means that this thing will bubble down. So you can basically have a app property that feels a little bit like a const that's at the root and can't be inherited. And then you can make these ones that do get changed and trickle down in the cascade, so. So if you set it to true, it can be changed. If you set it to false, it wouldn't update if you tried to update it? It wouldn't update on children, but it itself would update. It's like a oh, little Oh, I got you, trippy. I got you. So so then uh, you would have to update the child element itself if you wanted to. It gets weird. I think it just doesn't change. It doesn't. Oh, interesting. It, it doesn't okay. cascade. So it also means you can get perf benefits from it. So if you do inherit it's false and you register all your custom properties that way, they're naturally a little bit faster because it doesn't have to worry about the tree. It just worries about the root. Ah, yeah. Okay, so here's a here's a nerd question. When CSS is doing this, is it offloading to the GPU or is it doing this on the CPU? Currently, custom property transitions and interpolations are on the main thread. They are on the CPU. They are not GPU accelerated. To my dismay and Bramus, we're constantly like, we're, <laughs> we're like, we got a bat like a homie the clown. We're over there with the devs and we're like, we want, we want GPU accelerated custom properties. <laughs> uh, anyway, I don't know how many people know homie the clown, but it's probably dated me pretty quick. Homie the clown. That was that's old SNL, right? Like that's yeah. like Damon Wayans. Yeah. Oh man, back in the day. Uh, <laughs> I just be that for Halloween. Maybe not. Mm. <laughs> no. Let's, uh, in living color, in living oh, in color, living not color. SNL. Yes, that's, right. You, that's right. That's right. That's right. It was like a little, it was a similar show, right? Yeah. In living color. Nice. Okay. So let's actually look at the CSS. So we, we've got our, our custom property. Yep. And then in here, you set up a layer, which, what? Okay, cascade layers. Uh, normally in CSS, until we got cascade layers, everything you wrote was in one layer. And mm -hmm. so if you've been using Tailwind for a while, you notice that Tailwind has had layers in SAS, and that allowed you to sort of ahead of time articulate the, the stack, like almost like a bunch of pancakes for your own CSS. And this was nice because you could dynamically and asynchronously put something into a layer later. So normally before we had layers, before post-CSS had layers, you always had the index.style file that was... Uh, very meticulously hand managed in order, right? You're like, <laughs> yes. no, if you move Bootstrap down one line, all hell breaks loose. You know. Well, that's. Like, I mean, I think that that sort of thing is where this idea of like the append only CSS file comes from. Is that people learned that like order mattered. So if you were going to change something, you just put it at the bottom, right? You didn't change anything else because you, you might break the cascade. Yeah. Um, which is yeah, I like. I think is a legitimate challenge with CSS, and I, I definitely understand why people have looked for so many, so many different solutions to get away from the cascade. Yeah. So this is a native solution. Yep, every browser has this. It went interop uh, baseline across all the browsers last year, all at the same time. It's like one of those amazing things where it just sort of landed. Um, and what it allows you to do is, is create your own sections and then just put stuff in it at your own will, at your own rate, at your own speed. At, it could be after the page loaded. So imagine you've got a reset.style sheet and you, you know you need to have that at the top so that everything else can overwrite it. So imagine 
uh, you could load that 10 seconds later in the page and stick it on top, even though everything else is already loaded, and you just told it to go into the layer of reset. And so it allows you to, at any time, whether it's at your build time, most people do this at build time, but you can send it to the browser. Like if you go to my site, nerdy.dev, you'll see a bunch of cascade layers. Uh, and they're, I, I like them because they do a few things. First off, they give me this ordering so that I don't have to be so meticulous about it. B, it leaves a breadcrumb behind about the intent of the import. So when you import a bunch of stuff, usually you're importing a normalize and a reset, and then you're importing some sort of third-party libraries, and then you're importing your own base layers and your own custom properties, your own design tokens, and then you're doing, you've got all these things, and you probably were writing comments for it. But if you look in the styles pane of my website, it's in the layers. It'll say, uh, at layer, you know, normalize, at layer design system, at layer components. And so all of my components go to components.dialog, components.card, mm. um, and it, uh, so you get to articulate kind of what the intent was. You get the benefit of not managing it. And it just starts to feel very organized. And I think people like organization. It's almost like ES modules. You're getting to pull things out into smaller chunks and worry less about the cascade, but still be in full control. It's pretty rad. So, so what, oh yeah, uh, a question on this is, how do you define the ordering of layers? Because when we're looking here, we've got like layer demo, layer demo dot support. Are these in order? Like if we swapped these back and forth, would that change the way that, that things worked? So the way that I did it here is a very, uh, it's like as they are getting discovered, which is a, a lazy way of doing it. The way that you'll probably do it in your application is at the top of your first file that gets loaded, you establish the, the stack. And so- um, which, and, and what that means is, um, if I remember correctly, we can put something right up here, right? Is it at layer, yep. At layer, and then we would do like demo, demo dot support, and that specifies the order. And then if I want precedence to change, I can just take this and move it here. Sort of, except that support is a is inside of. So you can have layers inside of layers. So demo dot support is a layer inside of demo. As soon as the browser sees demo dot support, it creates the demo layer for you, and a layer inside of demo called support. Oh. So usually what someone will do is they'll be like, at layer, reset, comma, normalize, comma, or, or whatever, and they'll establish the whole thing there, and then they'll put components, and then at the very end is overrides. And this is like a really, really powerful thing also, is that overrides one, since it comes last, you don't have to put at important on anything. A, a thing that people don't realize a lot about uh, cascade layers is they severely reduce the specificity of your selectors. You don't have to battle something else because if your layer comes after another one, it's like a whole new style sheet cascade document is available for you. And so this this is sort of the same thing that we get when when people talk about why they like Tailwind, why they talk about uh, CSS modules, why they like uh, Stylex or CSS and JS, is that when you when you identify this layer, you're basically saying like, for the thing that I'm targeting in this layer, you can ignore all the other styles. Like this takes precedence. And so it doesn't remove the problems. Like I know in the in the Shadow DOM, for example, you wouldn't inherit like root font styles. Mm. So you'll still get those, but like you're not worrying about something in a component that's scoped to that component layer isn't gonna interfere with the CSS for this other component layer. Uh, so theoretically, like you can build your whole design system with tightly scoped everything with no CSS preprocessor because of cascade layers. Yep, two really cool use cases. Let's say you import uh, Tailwind or Bootstrap. Bootstrap was a notorious one that you had to battle, right? You're like, Ugh, I have to learn specificity in the scoring just so that I could defeat the score of this selector. Well, if you import Bootstrap into a layer and then you have another layer that comes with more importance, you can just do button and your selector will win over the Bootstrap button, even if the Bootstrap one had important on it. All you have to do Ooh. is simple select and change a style, and the browser looks at your layers and articulates them and applies them. Uh, it's really, really cool. In, in this, okay, this this speaks to my heart as as somebody who is is very interested in kind of getting, like peeling back the abstractions and, and re-examining like, what does the browser just give us, right? Because I feel like I learned a lot of ways to compensate for things that weren't implemented in the browser yet mm -hmm. when yeah. I was early in my career. Mm -hmm. and if I never stop to look at what's being added to the platform, I might just think like, maybe you always need jQuery, maybe you always need React, maybe you always need Tailwind or whatever the thing is, but the platform is evolving 
uh, these days, it feels like at the same rate Whew, as fast. the framework systems, right? And yeah. so as fast as frameworks are coming up with new solutions for things, once the community seems to standardize on one of these solutions, we're getting to see the platforms implement a way to do that that doesn't require any additional framework, doesn't require any additional, you know, extra JavaScript, extra CSS, any anything. Um, but we have to take the time to look, right? We have to take the time to explore and see what is the platform giving us that maybe we don't need to reach for this tool or that tool anymore because those tools blaze the path, right? Like, I think it's important whenever I start talking about this stuff because it sounds like I don't like tools. I love tools, but I think that the goal of any tool that is supplementing the browser functionality should be to eventually become obsolete. Yeah, that's and I feel like success metric, I agree, yep. And that was like what jQuery was very clear on. It was like, our goal is to eventually not need to exist. And I thought that was so dang cool that when, you know, Query Selector and some of the other pieces that were really popularized by jQuery made their way into browser standards, you kind of stopped hearing jQuery say like, you need us. Uh, it was it was almost like well I mean if what you're doing is just doing basic selectors, just use the platform. You don't need jQuery. Um, that of course didn't prevent jQuery from being in seventy something percent of websites today still. <laughs> but so like it's very very popular and and for good reason. Like it was an incredible library when it when it first yeah. came out and it it remains being a great utility library. Um, but like that's a good thing. We should celebrate when a tool is no longer necessary uh, because it it basically changed everybody's mind about how the web should work and the platform adopted those ideas and now that tool can say like we did it y'all now we can show SAS we don't need to add right now yeah exactly yeah, yeah talk about that a little bit SAS has paved tons of of paths and just like jquery did it was supplementing features that people needed it had layers first it had well it had variables first but now we got a more real-time custom property which is a little bit more powerful. And so, yeah, you, you have these opportunities when it goes into the platform to even add a little extra more if you can. Put it closer to the metal and really lean into the features there. So SAS has had nesting, still has nesting. It has color spaces. SAS has layers. It has all these features that so many of them have made it into the browser in the past five years or so that you don't need a build step. I still use um, a build step for concatenating my files. You know, I've got a bunch of imports and stuff, and I like it when that happens. Astro will do that for you, too. Um, and there's like a couple other small things that I like. So I'm very much these days using a preprocessor just for a couple of nice-to-haves that build out a style sheet. But I'm like, if you check my website, I'm using native nesting, native cascade layers. I'm shipping that stuff to the browser. Don't visit me from IE11. It's good. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> you know, that. but I actually, I love that because for a personal site, right, you can safely yeah. make the choice that, like, I'm building for the the modern standard, right? And you know, I'm not I'm not shipping things that only work in like nightlies of of WebKit or something. But like, I'm definitely I'm definitely using stuff that like isn't gonna work if you're on even like two versions back of Chrome or Firefox. Like, I I like the idea of like let's get this stuff out there, let's see it in action, let's you know let's normalize the use of it so that the platform sees that if they give us these tools they're going to get a lot of action like it, it i feel like i'm not the only developer and and judging by what the the chat is saying here i think uh there are, are dozens of us <laughs> <laughs> who are very 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 excited about this idea of being able to leverage the platform for as much as possible or even all of it like i i cannot wait for the day that i just build a website and like I don't need to worry about Vite anymore. I don't need to worry. And like Vite is great. You don't even have to think about it, but it'd be cool if I didn't even have to install it. Yeah. Like we're, and we're getting closer to that every day. Like what we do to use Vite is so stripped down compared to what we used to need. Module resolution, concatenation, you know, there's like a few things, live reload. But if you open up workspaces in the dev tools and you edit your code directly, you get live reload. In fact, it's even faster than live reload could ever be because it's direct manipulation. Uh, and the list goes on, but yeah, um, I'm still a big fan of Vite. I think that one. Yeah, I mean, they're like, and and again, these tools, like, we celebrate these tools because these tools are doing incredible things, and and then we we look forward to the browser like 
learning from what these tools are doing and adopting the best ideas and, and making it so that we don't need to install another tool. We as web devs just have the tools, right? Like mm -hmm. even like dev tools is a great example. In the back in the day, dev tools was an add-on to Firefox, yeah. right? And the browser saw that actually that's a great idea. That should just exist. And now none of us have to go and style, install Firebug or like tweak our settings or you know get a bunch of user scripts and extensions. We just get all this powerful stuff right in our dev tools that just works. We don't have to know that it's there other than to open it. Like we don't have to go, you know, seek in the community which tool does the right thing for my browser. Yeah. We just have it, right? Um, and and so I'm I'm very, very excited to see the way that this is is this trend makes me very happy. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Should okay, we so get through the back, first demo? Okay, back to demo. Okay. <laughs> so one of the reasons I like to use cascade layers in a demo is because it's very clear what you should be studying if you like the effect. The rest of it is support, right? So this would be so common. You'd open up a code pen and there'd be like, <laughs> there'd be like 50 new lines and then a bunch of styles tucked at the bottom. Like, ooh, don't look at these, you know? <laughs> um, or, or, you'd have a, or you'd have to scroll to the bottom of the file to see what's actually doing the cool trick. And so uh, I like this because I get to use layers. Layers mm -hmm. mean that the order doesn't matter. I get to promote the stuff inside of demo more than the stuff in the nested layer is. And so the nested layer is there literally supporting the demo. And, um, and from, a, from a practical standpoint, this has nothing to do with what we're demonstrating. This is just to make things look kind of nice. So we can really like collapse that and let's look at here. This is what's actually happening. Yep, and I think that's nice as you're learning and as you're trying to study what I've created, um, that the focus is really clear. The noise, right? This is noise to signal ratio. The mm -hmm. signal is really clear if it's clearly labeled. Demo. Okay, so let's talk, I'm gonna take this out because that isn't actually real. That was just me demonstrating the, the syntax. Um, this is fun. So there are two lines here. Jason. <laughs> <laughs> I know, this is like, it's so much, it's, okay. I love doing the show remotely. I will never, not have a guest on remotely if that's the way that works, but if we can get in studio every time. You can like, cut the vibe every with time a knife forever. in here, y'all. It's, it's, like, so, ah, it's so good, it's so good. <laughs> we, look, we can high five when something's good. Ah, oh, that's nice. So good. <laughs> ah, human connection. <laughs> I apologize, And got a little excited. Um, okay, so we got two lines properties. of CSS yep. and this, I know the easing, this came out of open props. Yep. So, so this is um, a variable that just gives us the ability to not have to know how like the math for a spring works. Yep. Great. And if you look at the value of that, it'll blow your mind. It looks like binary code and <laughs> I didn't write it, but I, I, <laughs> I defined it. Anyway, <laughs> now it's easy for you. So then we've got use cases of uh, here is our, our size yeah. property. And I'm gonna do my best to understand how this works, but I already know that I don't. So the transition part I get. So we can set the transition. We're saying we want to transition the value of size when it changes for one second using the spring. Got that. So for the box shadow, it's zero offset, zero- X and Y or zero. Zero X and Y, yeah. zero feathering. Zero blur. And then we want the, the offset is the size. What the heck is this? There's a lot of system colors, and that's a system color. That's literally the highlight color that you set in your system. It's like when what? you highlight text, there's also one called highlight text, which is the text color that's appropriately going to contrast against a highlight background. What? Yeah, there's a bunch of them. There's canvas, canvas text. Uh, I use them all the time because you basically get a free light and dark mode. These also play nicely with the color scheme property that you saw down on the HTML route um, in the support. So there's the blue from Mac, right? As you highlight text. Okay. And then we go back to dark mode and I'm just, I'm literally just toggling my, uh, where is my, oh, I can't because I'm in full screen. Um, I'm just in my system settings right now, toggling my, my setup. Uh, okay, so we're gonna leave that in dark mode for now. And sure. so that is, so what I could do is I could make that red. 100%, yep. Okay, I had no idea that that was a thing. That's very, very cool and super helpful. Like so many times I'm trying to guess what that color is and like approximate it, knowing that I could just pull it, again, how many hours have I wasted? Um, <laughs> but this is, so this is cool. So we've, we've literally got, we've got two 
two two like related lines of CSS and a five line property definition. Yep. And we've got this really cool thing that we're able to do where we're we're interpolating values. And the reason this is important, I can I can show this is uh, if we take this and we do like the root uh, size zero. It can't do the animation. The browser goes, oh, from zero pixels to 20 pixels. I don't know what you mean. To me, they're just strings. And you're like, you dork. They're not just strings. <laughs> they're, they're pixels. They got a you PX on the end. silly. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, you got you to gotta hold its hand, which is if you like TypeScript, you like holding things hands. Uh, but so... <laughs> Another thing to note here is that this one is actually better than it would usually be uh, if you're not interpolating values because we're pulling the, the value of the range, which is like scrubbing up and down pixel by pixel. So it still looks like it's animating. But if you were like hitting a toggle yeah, between like hover. off and on. Un uncomment the hover effect there. Oh, yeah, perfect. Nice little CSS It's almost like nesting. you predicted this was going to be something we wanted to demonstrate. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let me take this down, and then we're going to hover. I wonder if it's competing with the inline property. So, like, change some HTML so it reloads a little bit. And now hover it. There. Yep. Right? So this is because it can't interpolate. It doesn't know how to. And, and actually, you know what we should do? Can you define interpolation? Yes. Uh, interpolation is a, um, a way to go from one state to another state over time, given a duration and an easing. And so the, it's like when you walk from here to there, you did it over four seconds and it, you know. And, so yeah. and each second you moved like, you know, if, if the distance between here and there is one foot, then, you know, you, you have to do the math to go like, how did I go an inch and then the next inch and then the next inch. And if it's linear, it's like one inch per whatever the subset of time is if it's if it's like ease in out then it's more inches early and then fewer inches in the middle and more inches at the end yep. um and so it, what we're hoping for is the interpolation that makes this work really nice but because we don't have the types uh here css is like i don't know what that is so i'm just going to pop between the two values so instead we do the properties here let me fix that so it is not nonsense anymore and now CSS knows how oh, so to interpolate. <laughs> Gorgeous. All right. So we managed to use solid 45 minutes doing that. So we got to go Woo! fast. All right. All right. Go. No more tangents, chat. Jeez, <laughs> focus up. <laughs> All right. What happens next? Okay. Open up the, uh, go to gradient.style. Gradient.style. Yep. I'll try to be quick here. Nope. So here. gradient.style is a website that I built to empower you ab about gradients, to know the properties that you can use, to have a visual editor, um, all sorts of really, really cool stuff. And so here, I want you to select the radial gradient because this will lead us into uh, the next demo and then the final demo that we're building here today. So here's a radial gradient, right? It's positioned in the center. Yeah, you're changing a color stop right now. I built this thing with Svelte, uh, Svelte rules. I, of all the frameworks that I've used over and over and over again, I really like that one. So, okay, so you've got a gradient here. Now, what I want you to do is go to the right where there's the two stops in the boxes and drag all the sliders to zero. And now the slider in the middle between those two uh, boxes. Wait, what am I doing? Uh, go to the between those two cards. Oh, this, this one. Okay, yeah, I got you, I got so you. So those go to zero, yep, and then now drag that one. This is called a transition hint. It's a very seldom used feature of gradients. It's kind of like easing, but it's rudimentary. But what we're seeing here is I have two color stops, and they're both trying to be in the center. Mm. But with the, with the transition hint, I get to do a lot of the same kind of articulation that I would if I said that the second stop is 200 pixels from the mid middle or whatever. But instead, I get to use a percentage. And so it's going to go from the size of the gradient. We can see how big the gradient wants to be. And what we're doing is telling it where the middle point is between these two. And since we set the second one to zero, it's a hard stop gradient. Mm. Now, I want you also to take the trans the turquoise color and make it transparent. So just like click it and, and you know, put pound zero, 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 zero. So four zeros uh, for that nice shortcut hex of transparent. Yep. Okay, now drag that middle size up and down. 
This is the crux of the effect that we're building today, is we're taking gradients, we're making them hard stops, and then we're going to change that uh, transition hint with some dynamic data, with mm -hmm. our sound, with our voices. Our voices are going to wiggle that thing up and down, and then we're gonna create some cool effects with it. It's good, yeah, we, we warmed up last night. It's gonna be, it's gonna be great. <laughs> all, right. Uh, all right, let's go. Let's go, okay. Um, so you can close out a gradient.style. There's another demo in the document, which kind of breaks us into the next one here. Boom, okay, so. <laughs> Oh, not you allowed fork to fork? It. How dare you? Uh, okay, so slide That's the slider what I was here. trying to do. Now this should look pretty familiar. Slide it up big and small. Bam. Yeah, because it's got Bam. the same springy effect on it. So we took the first demo that we made where we used app property and we used a slider and we transitioned to box shadow just because it was a nice scalpel-like intro. Mm -hmm. And we've done the exact same thing, but this time against a gradient on a transition hint, just like we showed. Right. Now we're getting this black and white experience. So you could also imagine this experience could be used to mask things. So you could have the mask is bouncing and, and animated and really interactive about the way that Got it's it. sort of like uh, connecting with your DOM. And so um, this is the same code. It's just instead of having the, the box shadow, we're just using a background image. Yep. So same like two ways to solve a similar problem and we get a circle now instead of a square. Looks yep. dope. All right. Right, pretty fun. And Ready? I, just look at that, that gradient syntax too. Black space zero. We're setting the stop to position zero. We've got our, our scalpel, our, our transitioning property there in the middle. That's where the transition hint goes is between two stops. And then we say white zero. Very, very simple. Um, but we're gonna, oh, we're gonna turn this into some awesome, awesome stuff. I'm so <laughs> ready. I'm so ready. All right. So. We have the we've got the basics. We know what a property is. We know we know why they're important. Why we use this this syntax here. Uh, we've got our radial gradient set up. We we've got a little trick here to decide how big the the gradient is. So now yep. we've got these bouncy circles. I'm ready. Let's let's go into the chaos. Uh, what what right. happens next? Yeah. What do I have in the document next? I'm like, oh, it's time to look at some code. Oh no, we have the demo where. Uh, okay, so open up the. Uh, is it that app property gradient prototype? Yeah. This one? Yep. Okay. So this is where I started connecting your microphone input to the gradient positions. Okay. But I did another thing though, which is I split the, okay, so you can see the custom properties. There's two frequencies. Oh, is it just one? Oh, because this is the demo. Okay, so this demo only has one gradient, but as you enable your mic and you speak into it, you will now be changing the transition hint with your voice. Oh wait, we have to do this in debug mode, right? Yeah, the iframe doesn't like the... Uh... Can I do this in debug mode? Uh-oh, you might have to open this one up so that I can get to it. Oh yeah, because it's private, did I do that? Uh, can I... Oh yeah, view page source. Maybe if I, maybe I can just copy the, the frame. Will it let me take oh, copy it link let address? You fork it yeah. All right, great. Hey. So now we've got audio coming in from the mics, which you can, you know, as I'm talking, it's it's affecting the thing. Um, and we're running all of the audio from the whole show. So like Adam's mic, my mic, anything else we've got plugged in, hint, hint, um, will all <laughs> affect the uh, this this gradient. Yep. And it's it shows me all of my different uh, input devices. Yep, okay. HTML5 API for media access. Yep. Uh, actually, yeah, we probably should have like done a, a trigger warning for. There's a lot of motion. Okay, uh, hold motion on, hold coming. on. All right, okay. <laughs> Stopping now, just in case. Uh, the rest of the show is going to have a lot of this. So if the flashing is a problem for you, do please do uh, just be aware of that because I I think. It's going to be this this black and white, lots of, of like pulsing to, to audio and stuff. So just a just a little trigger warning before we before we continue, in case that is a problem for yeah, you. It's we not going to strobe like a Pokemon episode. But, right, but uh, but this yeah. this is this is strobing a lot. So just be just be aware. Uh, and sorry we didn't say that before I started this mic. Um, with that, I'm going to turn the mic back on. So last warning. Okay. So this is this is fun. Like it's already it's already <laughs> fun. And and so talk me through how this works. All right, so you uh, enable the mic, you get, a, you get access to the different, uh, so you can pull up the JavaScript if you like. You get access to the um, inputs, you choose the default input, and then you start observing the stream, 
you observe the data and you use request animation frame to set a custom property looking at that data. Okay, so so looking here, we've got this function to list devices. So this goes in and gets the media devices. This is all platform stuff, by the way. So again, yeah. this is just stuff you can do. Um, it's going to grab a list, creates our list of options. Yeah. Um, what is this? What is? What you doing there? Looks like, looks like a typo. Is it still working? It is still working, but cool. Fascinating. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Yay for tolerance. And <laughs> then markup. down yep. here on input. Uh, okay, so on input, we start the microphone. And then down here, let's see, get the user media, auto gain control, so on and so forth. All right, so now. Um, Here's where we get, yeah, so we need an audio context. That allows us to start tracking an audio stream. We look at the device. So look at, we got mic low and mic high. Mm -hmm. and state device. So that's taking the device ID and it's going to split the stream. So it's observing the same stream. It's two things observing the same stream and I'm going to split them up. I'm going to put a filter on them that uh, it's a high pass filter and a low pass filter. And this is going to give me two distinct ranges of your voice. One is going to be the upper bounds and the lower bounds. And I'm going to map those to a gradient so that the gradient can kind of have some dynamicness to it. It's not just a circle growing. You saw this was like a donut. Mm. And it's just fun to split the stream into two different types of data for me to play with. Right, yeah. right. And so so effectively, there's a, a little duplication here where you got to do some, like audio context still has a lot of like, you have to understand how audio works. So yeah. if you've never heard words like high pass and you're not sure what these frequency numbers mean, sorry, music is hard. <laughs> yeah. And I had to do some play. Audi audio is very, is very challenging. Um, but then... So we go through, we, we set up the high pass filter. We're, we're looking for sounds in the 3000 range and the 1500 range. Yeah. Um, we get into the mic, we connect here, good. And this is just setting up these filters. I love that word though, create bi quad filter. There you're on line 76. Yeah, yeah bi -quad why not, filter. right? Yeah, I know I exactly what that Me is. Too. That's I, very. I, I use that all the time. I definitely didn't have to learn and look that up. <laughs> Sometimes when I think that I'm really smart, I look at how like musicians do all of their audio mixing and stuff. And I remember that I just know a lot of jargon. And that's why, like, but this is what, like, when I read music stuff, it's like, this must be what it sounds like when other people listen to me talk. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, so then we get a, uh, what is this, an eight, like a, what, like an, in, what is this actually called? Uh, a UN eight array. A buffer? A buffer. That was the word that was nice. escaping my brain. Okay. <laughs> so we get both of these into a buffer for our low and our high. Yep. And then down here, we're reading the mic stream. Yep. So we get the value out of the buffer. Yep, and then at the line 125, you'll see if we have a connected device, then we're gonna request animation frame and we're gonna keep reading the buffer at the frame rate that we can animate with. And that's how we get our data flow and that's what we're gonna pipe into PartyKit so that multiple people are gonna be sending their data to PartyKit, streaming to everyone else who's connected and we're gonna see a combination of chaotic, ephemeral <laughs> audio experience that's also silent. <laughs> It's a visual thing, yeah. Yeah, so this is great. So, so basically, what we did in the first example, where based on the the range value, we are updating a CSS variable. This is technically the same thing. We are we're using JavaScript to update a CSS property based on something that's happening in the browser. It's just a little a little more work to get uh, frequency values out of a microphone. Yeah. Um, but. The, the concept stays the same. What, we, what we've accomplished here is ultimately get some value from JavaScript, whether, whether it's the value of an input, the value of the, the current audio coming through the microphone. You could do this with really anything, right? Position of a mouse, you could do it yep. with all sorts of stuff. And then you just update the, this value. Um, and if it's something that's not like an input on screen, you do it with request animation frame to prevent uh, locking up the main thread. Yeah. And to get like usually around what, 100, 120 frames per second or De so? Depends on the screen refresh rate. Yeah, you yeah. kind of give it up to the browser. It's like a polite way of saying, I'm going um, <laughs> to do something. As fast as you can, buddy. As fast <laughs> as you can, buddy, please. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it's so hard to not dig in all this stuff, but like document.first element child is the HTML element. And that's like setting oh. a custom property on root. We did lose something though. So um, we don't, we're not using app property anymore because we don't need to interpolate it because we are hand-holding it with request animation frame. So RAF has removed our need for it. That's, I think, why that's even cruft at the top there where it's got a app property defined. Oh, right, yeah, because we've kind of like taken it out. We've taken it out. 
So it's there, but it's not being used. Um, that's just my bad. But yeah, um, it didn't it didn't make any sense. If you're sitting there pounding it with new values, you don't need to interpolate anywhere. In fact, it, it didn't even do anything. It was so rapid. And then yeah, the background that's going to be and that's some the hot part of the design. <laughs> yeah. That's this is this is the fun stuff because once we get out here, difference means where is it actually? So difference means that it basically takes the the first color value and then the color value under it and does the math to figure out like what's the opposite color. Yep. Um, so right now you get black and white, but if we start changing colors, it's gonna get fun. Do it, put a color on that right now. <laughs> Let's do it. Uh, I'm going to set the color, which piece actually has the color on it? Uh, let's see, what's a good one to do a color on? I mean, just maybe the background, the whole page could be fine to put a color on it. Where is it pulling the color from? There's the color hot pink. I think is it's it? in the gradient itself, which is on the HTML element. Oh, look, you can see the custom properties dancing on HTML. You right? can, yeah, this is really cool to see. Uh, background color, black. All right, so let's make this uh, hot pink. Check, check. Well, that didn't work, why didn't that work? Hot pink. I don't know, what is the selector that that's looking at right now? Hot pink. Oh, is DevTools Why are you, not, it's, not yeah, it's you fighting it? me. It's, it's, it's fighting me probably for reasons that have nothing to do with this actual demo. Let's, uh, let's allow again, check, check, check. And we have our body HTML. Show me the color. Background hot pink. How dare you? Well, you know what? Let's skip it. Yeah. It's, it act, so one of the reasons that the experience in the design is black and white is because I, I tried with color and you could get some really cool psychedelic effects um, but there was also times where you couldn't see anything at all, where difference was having no effect, oh. and it kind of bums me out. So if I if I stuck to black and white, I was able to really get high contrast, a brutalist design that was always um, looking cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So lots and lots of cool stuff here. So uh, what should we do next? All right, yeah. Check the doc. Let's see. Is it time to make the site live? So it's time to see how. What does it look like if we? Take that audio stream from us, connected in Party Kit with everybody else, pipe it through his Felt Kit app, host it on Netlify, create rooms for people to join, and share an experience. So we're gonna make this thing not have an obfuscated name right now. I think we're gonna set it to noisy, so we'll see if that's taken. I'd be really surprised if someone had that. Yeah, it should be should be okay. Where site overview, site configuration. Site name, that's what I want. Yeah. Uh, manage site name and thumbnail. We're gonna call this noisy. And ooh, 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 ooh. here's the test. We are now live. So I'm gonna, let's see, I'm gonna start. I love that you used leet. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna send this to everyone. And now is the time to start participating. If so the first one of the first nine to join to enable their mic, your gradient will be visualized. Yes. Cool. We got folks pumping in. So here, here come oh, people. I see other people talking. All right, hit the uh, six dots and change your gradient. Look at us all just clashing and colliding check, check. together. Hey, wow, oh, bow, yeah. bow, bow. There we go. All right, all right. Now we got some conic ones. <laughs> yep. Huh? Just a little, little chaos there. This is good. All right, let's go. Let's yeah, let's go back to radial fun. Uh, oh, this is what I wanted. This yes. is this is so good. Okay, so uh, <laughs> so next, here's what I want to do. Uh, Adam, could you please play us a little tune? Ah, uh, yes. You ready? Do you want to talk about what this is? Also, this is a pocket operator. Teenage engineering, super minimal. Again, like talking about like sushi chef design, minimal. Like this is totally it. This thing is credit card sized, basically. The buttons, I mean, you could probably shock your hands on the back. I don't know. I haven't <laughs> yet, but uh, all of the like soldering is exposed. And this is the pocket operator Mega Man. And it's legit, dude. You can do some cool stuff. So let's see if I can come up with a cool riff to put through this channel. <laughs> oh, this is great. Okay, so, um, all right, but I, I want more. I want more. All right, here we go. We've got an electric guitar. <laughs> so this is untested. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I'm assuming it's going to look pretty sweet. 
All right, turn the volume up there. So can everyone on the stream? Let me unmute it. There you go. You all just got some shredding, and we got to see uh, a good, an electric guitar and what it looks like in these crazy greetings. Yeah, no stairway to heaven. <laughs> but so, so I think like what's really magical about this is that if we look at what's happening, like if we really dig into into what's going on in the code itself. Uh, let me mute that again. No, that's not the button I meant. There we go. Um, so if we look at what's actually happening in the in the code, yeah. Uh, let's let's go to the actual repo. Why not, right? Yep. Um, here's the here's the repo. If anybody well, wants to go, be made public. Oh, it is public. It's been public. Y'all been didn't public know. the whole time. Surprise. Uh, <laughs> so let's let's dive into what this is actually doing. So so talk me through what we're where like where should i look what's what's going on in here yeah peep the components so i mean the icons are going to be not very surprising they're just icons felt components um what's in lib like i forgot oh yeah okay so this is just like different stores and different stuff like that and we got our routes okay so this is like his felt kit uh architecture but uh pull up the device oh, uh what is our main component Oh, it's main components probably yeah. here, right? So we've got the page Svelte, which is going to be the home page, and then we have that route page. And Svelte gives me access to the URL uh, variables very easily. And so we've got a, like an action that just looks at the URL, passes it down to the Svelte component for rendering on the server side. And in the page Svelte, I can access that. It's right there on 22, export late, let data, data. So Svelte kid giving me the metadata from the page. That way I know the room that you're joining, and I can connect that to party kit. And so other people in the same room are, are getting this stuff here. You can see a lot of the same code, like we're managing a device list. So you can tell like the vanilla version that I made has fed directly into uh, this felt kit version here. So, and, yeah. and so the, the device media here is like, here's our list audio devices, looks pretty similar. I think it's exactly the same. I think it's exactly the same, yeah. And then we've got, um, these are all the different gradients. So the linear gradient, ah, there it. it is. There's the radial gradient and then the conic gradient. And so depending on how you change your settings, I invoke a function, I pass in the, the type that you're looking for, and then I feed it um, a little bit of data like the, these, this prefix that you see here. And so it's once I defined the gradients, it was kind of fun from there. And notice there's four and they're each using uh, the low and the high in different mm. ways to kind of just, it was just visual intrigue. So at that point I got to really get playful in the effects and people could go add more if they like. Yeah. Yeah. And this is where, you know, you could start also playing with the, the colors, you know, and, and, you know, kind of override some of this stuff, yep, exactly. uh, just to see what you can come up with. Um, so then in the party kit stuff, and this is where I think it gets really interesting. Let's see how much code there is to make this fully less than a hundred lines to go full multiplayer. Is there more party kit hidden around? There's the server, which is, uh, so if you go to the left and scroll to the top, there's the party kit folder here. This is the server. So you need to run this locally, go to source and look at server TS. This is the server. Okay, so about 150 lines so far. Yep. And a lot of this is so, you know, when you when you come through, you're sending events, right? Um, yep. You are, when you connect, you gotta make sure that you're in the right room. Um, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> and then you push in your connection ID, update the count. So that's how, yeah. So you saw live in the, as people joined, we saw the number tick up, tick up, tick up. And as they disconnect, I disconnect them. So the, the server's managing the number of connections uh, and managing the IDs of these folks as well. And JSON parsing the data back and forth as I transfer it. I like that you call them partiers. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> I like that. Uh, so then we've got, uh, let's see, opening up the code again on the client side. That's just party kit default stuff. I didn't use it. Oh, perfect. Um, okay. Then probably, we can. I could have deleted it. Same with the whole public folder. I didn't really need it. Um, when you make a party oh, kit. Oh, right. Because party kit does have the ability to host as well. Yeah, they host and you can go see the console logs. They do a good job of like kind of auto spinning you up a good client and seeing what it's like to consume the events and present them. Got it. And so on your side, we are 
So there's my little switch based on what kind of event is. So I have events, different types of events that I'm sending. So mm -hmm. like when you connect, I update the account. When you have connected your audio, I start to broadcast audio. And this was a, a tricky part is I needed streams, right? I needed different channels. And instead of um, making multiple sockets, I used the same socket and pumped things over it with just a flag. So they had a type there. That's why they're in uppercase, they're cons, like you have your count and your audio. Yeah. And then this uh, this audio here is we're getting the uh, that same like low and high data, yep. but we're able to quite literally just send those values to everybody connected to the site. And this is happening fast enough that like like it wouldn't be real time. You couldn't play songs together, but it's so close to real time that you kind of can't tell unless you're listening for actual sync, which is kind of mind boggling, honestly, like yeah. how nice that WebSocket experience is. And granted, we're, we're limited by physics, like, if, you know, me here or someone in Australia, the speed of light is going to add notable delay there. Yeah. Um, but if you're sitting next to somebody, you know, in the same, even just like North America, the delay is so low. It's, yeah. it's so cool. You can, you can play like real time games, right? It's like you, like when you play uh, Fortnite or whatever, the, the lag is like, you know, a few milliseconds, not uh, almost to the point of not being noticeable. Yeah. Um, so you can see there the, in the audio one, it says partiers dot update. That's a svelte mm. thing. So this is me updating the data that svelte has, um, right? Cause this is a store with inside of the application inside of svelte. Then um, I'm going for each partier. I'm looking at the value of their, their data and setting a custom property and look at the custom property has partier ID in there. There's like a, uh, on line 60, 60, you can see that that's how every partier has their own unique ID. I feed each of those oh. into the page. So the pages at this point, as we had 10 people connected, it was updating 20 custom properties on your page and the custom properties are requesting animation framing and being presented to you and you get this sort of audio experience. Super duper cool. Um, then down there, the gradient one, so line 73, that's another broadcast event, which is you changed your gradient, and I need to change it for everyone subscribed to the channel. So as we switched from gradients, it wasn't just us seeing the local change. We broadcast it. I update the gradient by invoking the effect that you saw earlier, like the gradient effect, and change the gradient that's on your page for everyone else. So there's a lot of like multi-tenancy things to do. If I was to refactor, I would like to move some of this work to the server. Mm. I felt like I was doing more on the client than I needed to in some ways. Um, but at, at the end of the day, I think I had a, a decent uh, uh, separation of concerns here. Yeah, I mean, it's it, at the end of the day, this is what, like, probably 300-ish lines of code, maybe 400 lines of code to build a real-time, multiplayer, audio-aware, animated, <laughs> like, there's just a lot going on in, yeah. in not that much space. So it's it really is, like, this is a, a very, a very cool thing to build with a what doesn't feel intimidating to me amount of work. I think the most intimidating part is wrestling the audio, the specifics of audio, just because that is that is a very challenging place. Yeah. <laughs> like understanding yeah. frequencies and how to get like out of out of the sound going into the microphone. How do you turn that into numbers that you can play with? Um, fortunately, lots of things to copy paste out there that will help yeah. you do exactly that. Yeah. Uh, let's see, what are some other good things to talk about? I mean, Svelte made it really CSS easy to animate. CSS Pong based on how loud the audio. That is oh. a, please build that, Lester like, Cab. That is a great boom. idea. And it would like. Well, it would, you'd have to like, it, so if it was frequency based, right? You'd, you'd like, if you want it to be all the way at the bottom, you're quiet. And then if you want it to be all the way at the top, you'd be like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a fun test you can do out there. Okay, so wait, there's four, there's four hidden Easter eggs. That Ooh, we need can to, we find them? That we need to tell people to find. Okay, so let's see. Challenge out there, everybody. There, there's one. Oh, we found one. Yeah. And that one I, I'm calling life after death. <laughs> oh, like somebody disconnects in the middle of making noise? Yes. Ah, Precisely. Okay, okay. So okay. you just kind of freeze wherever it was. I didn't do that. I just didn't fix it. <laughs> <laughs> because technically what somebody could do, what everyone could do is they connect to room 1337 right now is enable your mic, make some noise and disable your mic. And you would leave yourself permanently on the screen. Uh, and theoretically we could get a bunch of permanence that just sort of like sticks around. At least that's the theory. I'm not sure how much I'm fixing it. So that's one of the four Easter eggs is life after death. Another one is called turquoise. See if you can find the color turquoise. 
find the color turquoise? Yeah, because look, it's a black and white app. Where the hell could turquoise be? It's not in the code. It's in the experience. Well, Maybe yeah. someone in the chat will find it. Maybe someone in the chat has even already stumbled upon it. Find the color turquoise. Yes. And it's not like in the edges, like where the animation, like if you screenshot it, you get a little bit. Wait, did I just see it? It's, Hold on. It's is this not like a, there. No? All right. Um, where is it? There. Oh. Nice. Okay, well, the, all you right, gotta I got it. you got to be talking it. while the red of the button is shown, and it inverts it. Into oh, turquoise. I didn't even realize that was what was happening. Yeah. Neat. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. There's two more. Um, can you check the doc? Yeah. What did you call them? There I was. Called, uh, they had clever names. <laughs> <laughs> At least I thought they were clever. Give it the time of day. Oh yes. Uh -huh. Take me with you. Okay. Okay. So mm -hmm. time of day. How would you do that? Uh, let's see. Give it the. Oh no. No, come back. Give it the time of day. Yeah, you know, in the morning it's light, and at night it's dark. How dare you? <laughs> uh, I'm going to check. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I went to light mode, and I think I broke it. Do I need to refresh? No, this is just kind of the deal is the light mode and the dark mode have an inverse of interaction. Oh, and it's just okay. fun to see the difference there. So now we have um, a, a, like an inverted experience, which is still kind of cool. I like the life after death. It's like intersecting right now. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. It's really cool. Um, and the last one is take me with you. And take me with you is while your mic is enabled, click the back button to go to the home page. So like, ah, look at that, look at it go. And so you still have your mic enabled <laughs> and I'm still pumping it into a gradient on the page just for you to see in the experience here. That's really fun. I mean, this is, this right? This is, this is the sort of thing, it's, it's a way to play. It's not wildly complicated. You're not having to like, I don't know. I feel like a lot of times when I when I try to think of a demo, I feel the pressure to be like really unique. Like I need to build something that's never existed before. I have to invent something from scratch. And first of all, there's probably very few things left with the current platform state that are net new, right? Like it's it's there's a finite set of things that can be done. Probably mm -hmm. somebody has built something with each of these features that's pretty close to what you're imagining. So instead you're looking for different combinations that are are clever or interesting and you know you embracing the constraints of that instead of feeling overwhelmed or hopeless like I'll never come up with anything original. That's okay. You don't need to come up with something original. Just remix what's there and have yeah. fun with it. And in doing that, you come up with something this is absolutely original. Like I don't think this particular thing has ever existed before but it's all built with stuff that we've seen in different, in different places. Um, and I love that. I think that, that that makes for really special experiences when you can find a, a simple way to remix the things that we already know that is surprising or delightful. And the fact that this is the microphone driving CSS, I didn't know that I would have guessed that that wasn't on my <laughs> bingo card. <laughs> yep. All right, there's one more Easter egg. Uh, go to the home screen and refresh. So that way you don't, you didn't take it with you. Okay, so uh, just let it sit there. Okay. So this is, this would have been discovered by anybody who just like opened it up and were like, I don't know if I even wanna try. This is, this is lame. Well, after 20 seconds, I animate at property in those corners and just give some life to this. Oh, so there's the springy animation. So this is a callback to us in the beginning. Right, the callback right, to the right. original thought, the original intersection of difference in the blend modes, uh, seeing a custom property be animated and just makes the page feel less static after it has sat for a bit. This is great. I mean, this is this is so fun. And I feel like like I, I, I like the way that Linda said this. It it's it's both intimidating because it's it's like there's a lot going on it's very cool yeah. but also it doesn't feel out of reach like i i understand each com each component part um and so the the 
challenge here is in seeing how to fit together concepts into something unique, not necessarily in having to learn a lot of very complicated things in order to get it done, right? Yeah. And I think that that does, these are my favorite kind of demos because it didn't take us, you know, we're, we're not scrambling to get to the end of time to, to make this work. And, and like, obviously we, we cheated a little bit by having the code pre-deployed, mm -hmm. but like at the same time, when you look at what this code is doing, most of what we wrote is presentational. It's like making, you know, it's, it's the styles, it's the, the actual DOM elements. The interaction itself lives in this code pen. And yes. not this one, this one. And it's, it's just really not, it, you know, like 130-ish lines of code. Vanilla JS, yeah. Of straight up vanilla JS, and the vast majority of it is this audio wrangling. Yeah, it's the um, splitting of the stream. The stream split. <laughs> I karate chop it, you know? It, it's, it's coming in, and you just say hi-ya, you know? <laughs> <laughs> And then it, it also in here, looking at the CSS, like even with the cruft, it's under 50 lines beyond just the, the layout yeah. stuff. Oh, hey, um, scroll up there. There's a gradient there that's commented out above the radial. That one, that will bring color in. Look, lime and yellow. You can get, you can preview the psychedelic nature of it. Check, check. Um, oh, we need to, let's see, we need to save. I can't save this, so I'm not going to be oh, able to do it. Open it up in the debug mode and then enable that. It should be there in the HTML. Should be there in the HTML. Let's and see just, if I can get to it. Uh, I think if you have the HTML tag selected, that's good. Check the right in the styles pane. You should find the gradient. Oh, did it get cropped out from the thing? Something, something is weird in here that I don't fully understand. Um, I think this might be an artifact of like me trying to escape the the iframe on CodePen. Maybe. Also, DevTools does not like that I'm rapidly setting a custom property and you're like, hi, I'd like to edit that element. And it's like, this element is under chaos. <laughs> Let's see, here's, here's some code. Yeah, okay, so if you just steal that and stick it in the background image, um, well, which does yeah, this, maybe. Does this actually, if I just like, if I, I go gonna... here, there it is. Hey, yeah. hey look at that, okay. There we go. Look at that, some color. Some color. And so this is, uh, yeah, a little, little bit of hacking on, on CodePen because the reason we're doing this is that you can't, you know, I don't know how, uh, pass the audio context into a, an iframe. Yeah, there yeah. might be a way to do it with like the, all the iframe like allow tags and, and oh, like yeah, content right. headers and I stuff. Bet, yeah. I don't know if it works on CodePen, so we weren't able to figure it out. So we, you have to get like, past the the iframe yeah it's sandbox um, it's like the permissions to read your devices are right um, hidden yep. yeah so we have to get this to the top level which is what we've done here yeah look a gradient so yeah we have a gradient that also has difference and now we're just getting this fun psychedelic experience so you can imagine i was testing this out in the big one that had all the corners and all the different stuff and it looked cool it was psychedelic uh but at the same time a lot of there was like data loss and that's what was sad. Certain colors didn't, uh, yeah, don't cross streams. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, th I mean, this is wonder. Like, th it's, it's just, this is a lot of fun. I'm going to stop this and let's go back to. Yeah, we can check out more code if we want to look at the, um, some of the Svelte stuff that's in there. Yeah. And well, we're actually, we're, we're starting to come down to the end. So instead of, instead of getting deeper into the code, because that'll definitely cause me to run over time, yeah. let's instead do a, uh, let's do some, some further reading and resources for folks. So nice. I'm going to uh, start by just sending over, here is the, the app property. Uh, we shared that earlier. We have the MDN, uh, no, not there, MDN.IO's audio context. Look is that, that one gonna work? Yeah, it is. Yes, yeah, dude. it is. That is rad. There's the audio context if you want to to get in and, and learn that. Um, we use some Svelte Kit. What's the? Is it Svelte Kit .dev or Svelte .dev slash Kit? I don't know. Is that it? That's not it. Um, there's a there's a there's link a to handy it though. Link right there though. Perfect. Kit .svelte .dev. There it was. All right. So so, so get in. Gradient style also. Gradient dot style, which I think I still have open. I'm gonna copy it without the the current gradient details. Yeah, without the state. So get into that. Um, where else? I'm gonna throw people back to your site because that is a, a good little place. 
Um, oh, here's a question. Could app property be used for polyfills? Can you say more about what kind of polyfills yeah, you're what thinking you, of? What would you like to polyfill? My hunch is probably not because app property is a typed, uh, it's just a typed variable. Um, and the, the types are predefined. So they're the things that CSS has already typed. CSS is a typed language, y'all. Um, and so those types are all, all come from the docs that are already there. So you're going to have lengths, percentages, um, and uh, yeah, frequencies. And there's all these different size types or different different types of app property opportunities. Because there's like background images, there's URLs. Um, so I'm not sure how you could use it to polyfill something unless the polyfill was something that needed to be typed. You can build type safety into your system with app property so that someone can't break it. Like if you put the color red into the size value of the code pen, um, it doesn't work. The browser goes, I'm not going to use red here. And so it's it, a length only, you know, so it, it just throws away. Um, and so it doesn't it doesn't break, like it doesn't throw an error. It just ignores the bad input. It tolerates it. It's which, classic CSS. Yeah. yeah, which is like, I think that is something that is both very, uh, it can be challenging, but is also very nice about CSS, is that CSS doesn't throw errors. It doesn't explode. It just ignores bad input. Yeah. I love that it's fault tolerant. Um, a lot of people would want it to break, and I'm sure there's ways to do that. But like JavaScript, I always feel like it's weird that you're doing this powerful thing and one little character throws the entire thing off, but CSS is tolerant. It'll keep moving. Did they specify the polyfills they wanted? Uh, I think it was it was thinking about the uh, CSS Houdini API. Uh. So like you couldn't, you can't use CSS properties because they have to be supported in the browser. So like you can't bring them back or whatever, mm. right? App property is part of the Houdini spec. It's like the, the first entry. And this also is going to be in Firefox soon, app property. And Safari already has app property. They're probably not going to do the rest of Houdini. Like there's the paint API. And the paint API uh, doesn't need app property, but app property types the parameters that get fed into the paint API. So you had this like circle of typed information that you could use. Uh, so that way when you're painting from the Houdini API onto Canvas, uh, you had confidence that the variables that you were getting in, the parameters being passed to your function, weren't going to break your logic. Excellent. Okay. Um, let's see. We are we are just about at time here. And so, chat, now's your opportunity. Do you have questions? If you have questions, get them in right now. Um, Adam, yeah. what, uh, let's see, what, what else should we... Is there anything we want to cover? Any other details that we want to share? Any other any other links or resources? The doc had a couple additional notes. Like, I had some architecture um, things. Like, I wanted originally to use Astro, um, but then once I needed um, rooms, and there was this concept of like, I'm like, oh, I'm not statically generating it. I need server side generated room destinations. And then I was like, but wait, I could make it a single page app. But then, and actually, Svelkit kind of does a hybrid thing between. Um, single page app and multi page, where when you go to a room and you hit back, the reason life after death exists is because mm. Feltkit is um, making changes to the page without changing the URL. They're doing the work to make it feel like a spa, even though I authored it as a multi page experience. Oh, here's a here's a great question. Yeah. When like where can someone go find that list of colors, like highlight in the the other yeah, system colors? Yeah, system colors. You'll find them in a CSS spec. Um, Yep, CSS system colors. MDN probably has a good list. There they are. There accent they color are. and accent color text are under, uh, they're not in every browser, but active text, button border. There's a, like, look at button face. I like, it's butt on face. I'm like someone, someone that was more mature than me named that. Um, canvas tech. Okay, so Canvas and Canvas text, I use those all the time because Canvas is going to be whatever the browser is using as the background color for the document, and Canvas text is whatever the text color is. So you're guaranteed a, uh, a contrasting experience that also is light and dark, um, mm. which is really nice. Yeah, and and the nice thing about this too is like I I lean on inherit a lot, but sometimes you're not inheriting because you've like put, you know, you're a couple layers in or whatever. And I want to like have my footer be light and dark, but I don't necessarily want to have like a footer color and like body yeah. text color. So knowing that if I set this, uh, if I set my, my body to have text color and background color, mm -hmm. then these will cut, will carry that through. 
in a way that updates without me having to change variables, without me having to do really anything other than know that I've set those somewhere in the document. Yeah. That's good. You do need color scheme, the property to opt your document into the light and dark default browser styles. Right, right, right. Otherwise, it'll just be a light theme. Got it. Okay. And color scheme is cool too because it, it, it tints all your inputs. So like all the uh, radio inputs and check boxes, like the color scheme property will make them dark. So good. Very, <laughs> very, very, very good. Um, I great love. Question. Great question though. Yeah. The system thank you. Are cool. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate that. That's that's very nice. Um, Always appreciate the content. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, Adam, where should people go if they want to learn more, not about this, but about you specifically? I've, I've linked to your site, where else? Yeah, I got an RSS feed, so if you don't want to deal with the social network, you want to get straight straight from the stream, there it is right Look there. Look at it go. Yep. Linked, um, and actually linked right on the front of the site. I, I wrote a whole post about missing RSS, and I'm, I'm very happy to see that come back. Oh, this is a nice little effect. Look at that. Thank you. Poof. Yeah, it's an exploding Poof. back uh, box shadow. Because why not, right? Because why not? <laughs> yep. uh, I think each one's a different color, too, up at the top. Anyway, um, find me on Twitter if you want more. I, I tend to, to tweet more than I post on my own site. Um, my, my site is, tends to be leaner, and Twitter tends to be um, a little bit noisier. A little noisier, because you know, I also repost things there, and I don't tend to repost on my personal blog. Um, you can find me on Blue Sky. You can find me um, on Mastodon as well on frontend.social. Just look for the handle or guy link. Um, I've also got a couple of podcasts. I'm on the CSS podcast. Somebody already shouted us out. Thank you so much. That's Yuna and I. Breaking down CSS adds the computer science side of it. Um, we really dig into the details uh, of the specs and all of the full features of a particular API of CSS. If you want to like really dig in and get your mind blown, uh, I think we make it really approachable, so it's not dry. Um, and then I have a sillier one, which Jason has been on, called The Bad at CSS Podcast. And that's me and David Wait, East. where is this? Um, I mean, we, <laughs> it's pretty new. Oh, we're still making a website. Uh, here's a, here, here, hey, there's this one is, of my blog Here's posts. a link. Nice, okay. Um, that and, and that one gets sillier. We have guests on. We basically, empath we, we sit around together at the table and talk about how hard CSS is. And by doing so, and you know, explaining the things that were difficult, we actually end up learning from people because we're like, I didn't even know that was possible. And they're over there struggling with it. And so you get this nice uh, feedback loop of people being humble, mm. um, but also simultaneously teaching you kind of cool stuff. Um, those are the great places to start. Also the Chrome developers blog. I'm constantly on there. So my job is a CSS at, at Chrome. And as new CSS lands in Chrome, you'll find it right there first. That is, that's the, if you want stuff and you want to sit from the source, this is where you want to go. Yuna and I and Bramus were all on here posting about the latest and greatest, and we go into pretty good detail and um, catch all those. Yeah, those are great. It's great. Love it. All right. Uh, and I saw a question about uh, where can I rewatch? Easiest place to rewatch is if you go to the Learn with Jason YouTube and click this live tab. You can find everything there. This episode will be rewatchable right away as soon as as soon as we go off you'll be able to start it from the beginning and, and watch so um can actually just give a little link to that in the chat for anybody who needs it also share that noisy link with your friends if you've got coworkers, if you're remote working with people right now send them that noisy link to a room tell them to enable their mic and you both can just sit there and have an ephemeral silly moment together in this brutalist noise experiment <laughs> and you know this is actually like a fun application of this i was just thinking of is if you were on a meeting right and you want non-disruptive participation <laughs> you could basically have the the team sit in a thing like this so that like they can all be muted in the call but like as they see different things they can make noise and like the the page will show the the excitement of the team as as like like an announcement meeting or something so i think that yeah there's a lot of fun ways that this could be used and played with um yes yes excellent this is awesome so adam we're out of time chat we're out of time uh, make sure you head over to the website. Uh, this episode, like every episode, this is not the thing I wanted to scroll through. Um, there we go. This episode, like every episode, has been sponsored by Netlify and Vetsu Code. Thank you both very much for making this possible. Um, and we 
the the transcript today i we had a little scheduling issue so we didn't have the live transcript today but usually we have live transcription which um we'll make sure that we get transcription into this episode we'll use the the robots to do it this time while you're on the website make sure you check out the schedule because we've got nothing listed yet okay go here and uh and and hit the calendar button or or just pay attention on discord on youtube on wherever because I have new episodes scheduled that I just haven't put on the website yet because I get lazy sometimes. How dare you? I'm Human. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. Any parting words for the chat, Adam? Dude, this was so much fun. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I had a blast making this. I, I basically spent a week making something silly. I get to share it with you. Uh, what an amazing experience. I really appreciate this. Dude, you rock. You gotta be my favorite on the web. <laughs> One more in-person high five. Hi-ya! Yes. All right. <laughs> Thank you all so much for hanging out. Hopefully we're gonna be able to do a lot more of these in-person Learn with Jason episodes coming in the future. So, uh, you know, tell your boss they should be sponsoring this show so that I can afford to bring people out here. With that, thanks for hanging out, friends. We'll see you next time.